The story started 60 years before Peter Benchley wrote the novel Jaws. It was on July 1st, 1916 that the waters ran red as Charles Vincent was attacked by a shark off the New Jersey coast. Sunbathers and fellow swimmers were horrified when a lifeguard pulled the bleeding man from the water. Now, this first shark attack was considered a freak accident, but five days later, another encounter took place 45 miles up the coast. A young bellhop yelled, a shark bit me, he bit my legs off, and then never uttered another word. This time, panic set in, and steel nets popped up in swimming areas on the beach, and it was the beginning of the shark monster panic in the American Northeast. Hooked yet? Well, if you want to hear the story and other strange stories from history, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more. Now, the movie Jaws has become such a potent specter of horror in our society that it literally caused a case of clinical cinematic neurosis in a 17-year-old girl. Now, you yourself might shake off memories of Jaws with facts and figures proving you are more likely to be in a car accident on the way to the beach than ever get attacked by a shark at the beach. But did you know that one town was haunted by a real-life shark that closed beaches and deemed it a serial monster? The shark we're talking about today is known as the Matawan Man-Eater, and it haunted the Jersey Shore in 1916. North Sill of where lifeguards were dropping protective steel nets and fishermen were calling the waters, the small town of Matawan was soon to become the site of a man-eating terror. The village itself wasn't on the beach and was a full 11 miles from the open ocean. What it did have, though, was a small tidal creek that was about to be home to a very large fish. Now, on his way home from a morning of fishing, a retired sea captain was the first to see the behemoth. While crossing the town's newly constructed trolley bridge early in the morning, he recounted seeing an enormous shark swimming inward. According to some reports, he rushed into town to warn everyone, but his cries fell on deaf ears. Shark attacks on the coast might be a threat, but what did their small inland town have to fear? It officially began on July 12th. Factory worker Lester Stilwell, who was 11 years old, had been let off work a little early and joined a couple of his friends swimming in the creek. They splashed and they played, then Lester asked all of his friends to gather round while he floated on his back. As they watched from a few feet away, their friend was violently pulled underwater. He bobbed up, he bobbed down, he bobbed back up screaming, but was pulled under again and again as the foaming water turned red. His friends ran to town as fast as they could, yelling for help. Now, several men dove into the creek thinking the boy had had a seizure or was suffering some kind of other uh, mental or physical ailment, but 24-year-old Stanley Fisher found the boy and quickly realized something was holding on to the body. Fisher managed to wrest the corpse from the jaws of the shark, but he himself was attacked trying to get it out of the water. The child was dead before it left the creek, but Fisher died hours later at the local hospital. Robbed of their meal, however, the Matawan man-eater wasn't through. Within an hour of the first attack, the shark attacked a 12-year-old boy swimming upstream. Now, this boy escaped with his life, but lost a leg to the voracious fish. And though the boy is the shark's final known victim, the story didn't end there. It didn't end there at all. The town now was out for revenge. They put out a bounty on the shark and went mad with vengeance. Men and women alike began trolling the creek armed with shotguns and even lined the creek with dynamite. They hoped that they would be able to just blow the shark to smithereens. Likewise, on the coast, newspapers helped whip people into a shark hunting fury. According to accounts, fishermen and boat captains killed hundreds of sharks. No one knew the species or the real size of the man-eater, but they didn't seem to care. Any shark was a monster. Eventually, a fisherman caught the aquarium horror in the bay itself. The shark was eight and a half feet long and was reported to be a great white. A local biologist autopsied the shark and found 15 pounds of human remains in its stomach. Though some details reported in newspapers are in doubt, particularly the species of the shark, it was probably a bull shark and not a great white, for instance, the lasting effects of the Matawan man-eater can't be overstated. You see, up until this point in time, sharks in the temperate waters of the American Northeast Coast 
were thought to be simply incapable of killing. They had small mouths. They could only bite people accidentally. American scholars as early as the 1800s agreed that the worst a local shark could do is nip someone accidentally. In fact, in 1891, an American banker and adventurer offered a cash reward, asking for anyone who had proof to authenticate a single case of a shark attack off the coast of the northeastern United States. The director of the American Museum of Natural History doubted that a shark was even capable of biting off a limb without great, sustained, concerted effort. He said it was more likely you'd be struck by lightning than bit by a shark, a figure that stands to this day is true, believe it or not. But the terror incited by newspapers introduced the idea that sharks were these ferocious, somehow even evil creatures. Just listen to this quote taken from Scientific American, published in the fall of 1916. There is something peculiarly sinister in the shark's makeup. The sight of his dark, lean fin lazily cutting zigzags in the surface of some quiet, sparkling summer sea, and then slipping out of sight not to appear again, suggests an evil spirit. His leering, chinless face, his great mouth with its rows of knife-like teeth, which he knows too well to use on fisherman's gear. And while this pseudo-scientific characterization of a shark is somehow evil is too perverse in modern times to be taken as fact, this shaped much of the public's perception of the science of shark attacks for years and decades to come. This, combined with newspaper satire, the oncoming threat of submersible human U-boats, characterized as sharks themselves, preying on unsuspecting American ships, and real-life shark attacks suffered by large numbers of U.S. sailors in World War II, Americans were left with a cultural perception that sharks were terrifying, killing machines with evil inside them. The very movie Jaws may not have invented the idea of a killer shark, but instead it capitalized on it by drawing its inspiration from these events. Sheriff Brody himself specifically references the Matawan shark attacks in the movie, and the shark hunter Quint's account of losing his brothers in arms in World War II was a direct reference to the real-life occurrence of the USS Indianapolis. Quint's shark hunting itself was a parody of the real-life shark hunter Frank Mundus, who stated the only real difference in technique between himself and Quint was that he preferred to hand throw his harpoons rather than use a harpoon gun. Today, conservationists, scientists, and aquariums have worked hard to dispel the rumors born of the Matawan attacks. As our divers at the Ripley's Aquariums will attest, our sharks have no interest in attacking people and should be celebrated for their unique behavior. The few shark attacks that happen on a yearly basis at beaches today are often a case of mistaken identity. A shark misinterpreting a hand for a flailing fish or a floating surfer for a seal. And when these bites do happen, they are rarely fatal. Yet, despite this, public perception of sharks has remained tainted by Hollywood. If you're not afraid though, and want to see sharks up close, be sure to visit one of the Ripley's Aquariums yourself, or have fun at the beach.